Hi, I'm Mason Marangella from Vertex VertexFX, aka The Rig Doctor, and today we're talking about bass signal path and the order to place your effects in order to have the best possible tone. Let's do it. If you're familiar with our channel, you know that we've actually already done a signal path video that was specific to guitar a couple of months ago. And if you're interested in that, you can always check that up above or in the links below. However, a lot of bass players in that comment section of that video had requested that we do one that's a little bit more specified toward bass. And although I'm not a bass player, I still have a very good idea of where things should be. But because I'm not an actual bass player, I wanted to bring in a little enforcement here with my friend Yannick Wisdala, who is a wonderful bass player, plays with Bob Reynolds all the time, as well as has an amazing YouTube channel that you should check out. And he's gonna be kind of going through some of my picks and recommendations, and not only showing how those actually sound in practice and how maybe some order differentiators might sound different with one placement over another, and which one might work best for you, but he's also gonna do a little bit of critiquing on my different signal path recommendations, and maybe say what he lands on as a bass player, or where he might find that other bass players might prefer one signal path over the other. Again, the big thing to remember here, as always with signal path, is it's always about personal preference. There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer. Ultimately, you wanna try this out for yourself and make sure that it works in your actual context. And also remember that signal path generally won't matter if you're not combining effects. This is in particular when we're talking about overdrive devices in a lot of cases. It doesn't really matter which ones go into the next so long as they're not used together. When they're used together is when you might run into some problems pending that there isn't any sort of impedance sensitivity. But enough about that, we're gonna get into it much more detail. Let's get into talking about bass signal path. I'm gonna first kind of give my rough overlay. I'm gonna go in sequence of what I think in terms of the order. And then I'm gonna bring in Yannick periodically where there is any sort of maybe question marks or maybe more than one way to do it so that he can talk about why you may wanna choose one particular signal path over the other and how that actually sounds in practice. So let's go ahead and get into the signal path. So let's start with our fictitious bass signal path. Now before I get started on talking about the signal path, I wanna just mention one key differentiator between guitar players and bass players, in case you're a guitar player watching this video. Bass players have been utilizing parallel signal paths, I would say in greater numbers than any guitar player that I know. They've been doing these tricks where they take a DI right off the bass, right when they come into the signal. So they have the bass come into a DI, the DI splits the signal where one side goes to the mixing board and then the through would go to this pedal board and go through all the different signal processing, the compression, the distortion, overdrive, modulation, delay, reverb. This way they can have parallel signal paths. They have the clean bass right off of the input and they have all the processing and then they can blend those two acoustically in parallel with each other. Now after the DI is one of my favorite pieces of gear that I always talk about on the channel, which is buffers. Now buffers for bass are a little bit different in that the impedance ranges are quite a bit different than guitar. Generally on guitar, all we see is one meg input impedance pretty much across the board. But for bass, it can range anywhere from 500K and I've seen up as high as 10 meg ohms. So quite a different variety. And basically the main thing that you wanna to try to do is to try to match that input impedance of your buffer as closely to what the input impedance of the amplifier is so that you can load your bass pickups the way that they're used to when you're plugging into your favorite amp. Now, one of my favorite buffers for this that has a range of input impedance is made by Laylee, and it's the Sunday driver. And you can range from one meg to five meg, so you can conceivably cover a, quite a bit of ground or choose a number that's as close to the input impedance of your amp and pretty much get all the way there. Now, if you want to nail it exactly, you could always build one of our DIY buffer kits where you can set your actual input impedance by whatever value you set for R1 on the actual PCB itself. But let's talk about some contingencies where maybe you wouldn't want a buffer or you would want to put some effects before the buffer. So in the case you have impedance sensitive devices like a vintage fuzz face or a tone bender or some sort of treble booster or some sort of more guitar oriented effect that has an impedance sensitive kind of transistor in there, that would need to go before the buffer. You'd want to keep that as close to the bass as possible. This is presuming that you have passive bass pickups. Another condition where you wouldn't want to have an input buffer is if you already have an active bass and that's all you use. Active basses are basically taking the buffer and putting it inside of the actual bass instrument itself. So the buffering and signal condition is just starting at the bass before it even gets into the pedal board. Another condition where you wouldn't need an input buffer is if you have a wireless. 
A wireless is already converting the signal to low impedance once it gets to the receiver, so there's no need to add another input buffer in the event that you already have a wireless present. Now, if you want to be able to switch between wireless and going cabled, I have a cool diagram that I'll link below that I did for Paul Jackson Jr. on his studio rig, and it shows exactly how you can take a wireless unit, build a little interface box that has a defeat that adds in an input buffer whenever the wireless isn't being used. So when you're cabled, you have buffered, and when you're wireless, you don't have an input buffer at all. And on the buffer spec, you definitely want to, again, match that input impedance to whatever your amplifier is, and then you want the output impedance to be as low as possible, preferably 100 ohms or lower, as close to zero ohms the better, but reasonably anywhere between maybe 80 and maybe 150 to 200 ohms is probably okay. But as you get higher than that, the worse it's going to be at being able to drive a lot of capacitance on the output. All right, so enough about buffers. That was a long-winded one. Let's go to the next effect. Next effect I'd put in the series is a tuner. Now, some tuners actually do have built-in buffers, and in the case that the buffer actually meets the requirement or the spec that I just recommended, you might be able to forego using any sort of input buffer at all and double up your tuner as a pedal that has that high-quality input buffer. We actually have a great list of pedals that have high-quality buffers in them that are already built in. It's in another video I did a little while ago, and we're gonna link that up above and in the description if you're interested in checking out what some of those pedals are, as well as a kind of a PDF list that I created of all the pedals and their actual specs that meet this requirement as a high-quality input or output buffer. After the tuner is where we start to get into some variability. Now, I like to put filters in this place. Now, what do I mean about filters? Typically, I mean things like bass waz or envelope filters. These are typically places that I like to keep those two effects because I want to keep them as close to the bass as possible. When we're talking about envelope filters, I feel like the way that they react is more accurate and more intuitive with the way that you're playing the closer they are to the instrument. So the closer you put that to the bass, the better that they're going to interact with the bass, the more that they're going to interact the way that you're used to. Equally with waz, typically when we think about waz in terms of guitars, we think about those very close to the actual instrument itself. This is just kind of a way that we've been accustomed to hearing things. There are some people that do, however, like to put their filter effects after overdrive or a little bit further down in the chain. But let's bring in Yannick to kind of talk about how these effects interact and where he might use some of these filtering effects in his signal path and what the differences in sounds might be. Hi, I'm Yannick Wustala. I am a musician who just happens to play bass, and I'm primarily a jazz musician. When I make music, it is of the improvised nature. Aside from that, I've you know been working in the studio on and off for the past 20 plus years and been touring the world with some of uh, my heroes, some people you might know. that nothing I can tell you that you can't find on Wikipedia. My main Main goal, uh, when I'm playing, no matter what actually, on stage, talking to you in this video is music first, gear second. I know that sounds a little bit silly as we're talking about gear, but that's the way I go into it. That's how I find I get the best out of all these devices. So I'm not gonna say I disagree with Mason about any of this stuff actually, because I think it, it can't be reiterated enough that all of the things both of us are talking about in this video are completely personal choice. I, I should also say that I completely agree with him for, for where he's suggesting to put it, for the kinds of sounds he suggested to make with it, like that auto wah, that, that quacking duck kind of thing, maybe that Bootsy Collins kind of funk thing, that Mutron sound, that auto filter. I think it's actually great to have it further up front in the chain if that's the sound you're going for. With the filter, uh, the way I'm using it, I'm actually using the filter in the Meris Auto Bit Junior that is hidden under my board here. Um, and it is turned on and off. I have presets, MIDI presets in the auto bit, and it's turned on and off via the MIDI switcher. So it's not something I'm using as an auto wah. Um, it's something I'm using as a uh, kind of a sweeping filter. So when I have a sound with an octave thing, with a little bit of fuzz, I'm really uh, wanting to filter everything in the chain. Um, so that's why I have it kind of later. Again, this is how I use it. It's not particularly conventional when you think about a bass player, a bass player who's working and playing lots of different styles of music. It's a very personal thing. I'm gonna agree pretty much 100% with what Mason is saying, but I'm also gonna have my take on it and some of the time that is gonna be completely different and upside down. 
So you heard from Yannick on that. Let's move on to our next category, which is dynamic pedals. In this, for bass, I typically think of dynamic pedals as a compressor. Now, compressors are something that's kind of interesting. A lot of people have been making compressors now that are emulating kind of what older studio compressors would do in a mixing board, yet we're disaggregating them and we're putting them up in front before the amplifier, which isn't generally where they would go. However, in a lot of the pedal board rigs, these seem to work really well up front, especially the one that I've got shown here, which is the Cali 76. This is a really nice one to use with bass, really helps kind of tighten everything up and gives you kind of a mastered quality to the bass sound that then feeds through the rest of the effects. But again, I'll bring in Yannick to kind of break this down and analyze that and give us some sound examples of how that might be different in those two different positions. So when it comes to compression, I get to show you perhaps my favorite part of this Vertex FX pedal board, which is the underside, the hidden area. This is where I keep my compressor. It's an always on pedal. It's not something that's particularly aggressive for me. And I was never like a compressor guy until somebody came up to me, the, the maker of the builder of Miura, um, the M2. That's what I'm using, the Miura M2 compressor limiter. He came up to me at a gig, said, hey, you want to try this pedal out? Think it might sound good with what you're doing. And he was absolutely right. It's a, a more of a feeling thing when it comes to compression with me than it is a huge sound difference. I feel it in my fingers. I feel there's a little bit of uh, pressure to play against, a little bit of resistance. Um, let, me, let me turn it off, something I never do with this. It's just always on. And here we go, we'll put it on. And to me, it just warms up the sound very, very slightly. Take it off. And I try and have the gain structure pretty balanced so there's no big boost with it. That is second in my signal chain. That's where I like it. Um, I have the, the volume pedal is the very first thing that I'm coming into the EP booster. And that goes into the Miura M2 compressor before I get into kind of my octave stuff. But it's very, it's very much up front in the signal chain for me. And, you know, when all of the other effects are, uh, are, are in bypass, the only two pedals that are engaged are the exotic EP booster and the Miura M2 compressor. All right, so after dynamic pedals, I think the best thing to go into next is pitch. And of course, the classic Boss OC2 octave is a great pedal for this. This is something, again, that we're still keeping relatively close to the bass instrument, close to the input of the actual system. Again, these also, like a lot of the dynamic pedals and a lot of the filter pedals, work better and trigger better the closer they are to the instrument, so you're gonna get better tracking of the octave the closer it is. Again, some people do like to use this after overdrive, and I have seen cases where it's been used after the distortion and overdrive section, but again, some of this is personal taste, and some of this is just based on what the sound is and what you're going for. So I'm gonna bring back in Yannick. He's gonna talk about these sorts of pedals using octaves or pitch pedals, and where those might fit best in the signal path and how they might sound different either before overdrive or after overdrive. So pitch is a pretty big one for me, along with Juan Alarete and Tim Lefebvre, the three of us, uh, and John Davis, of course, the three of us are pretty well known for kind of cornering the market on the classic OC2. Lately though, um, thanks to MXR creating this pedal, which is based exactly on this pedal, not just on the OC2, but they actually took this very pedal of mine, an original 1982 Boss OC2 Octiva with the R on the end, this color, you guys know, you've seen my OC2 video if you're an OC2 fan, I'm sure. And they cloned it, they did a really amazing job in a chassis that is, as you can see, a fraction of the size. So down here on my pedal board, you can see that the OC2 would just take up way more room than I have. And it's the classic Jojo Mayer setting. It is octave one maxed out. It is the direct level at zero and the octave two at zero. We're just concentrating on full volume with the octave one to give me that kind of... to give me that kind of sine wave sound. The real stuff with pitch for me, this, the stuff I, I have the most uh, fun with is the is the harmonizer stuff. That comes kind of in the middle of the chain for me. And I'm I'm pushing a few things into it. So if we take one of my typical harmonizer patches, these are four note chords produced by having a parallel signal chain and two two note blocks in the HX stomp. 
and there are just so many things I love to do with this to modulate it. I'll push that uh, the Frant a bit, the Iron Ether Frant a bit, which is a sample rate reducer and a bit crusher. I tend to use it more as kind of a gated fuzz sound. That's why it comes earlier in my signal chain. Give it a little bit of reverb with the Dark World. Swe swell stuff in with the volume pedal. And I can change the chords. So I think an important thing to know about how I have my signal change set, set up for pitch shifting and where I have the pedal I'm calling a fuzz pedal, even though it's not the Iron Ether Frant a bit. Um, for processing the octave stuff, I have the octave first, and then I like to have my distortions and uh, overdrives or fuzzes after that to give me that. kind of fuzzed out square wave sound. But when I'm in the higher register of pitch shifting, like you heard with those chords, when I'm kind of way up in this register, let's add a little verb. I kind of like to have the fuzz before that. So I'm pushing the frant a bit into the pitch shifting. Again, just a personal preference. I know Mason talked a little bit about that being completely the opposite from the way I'm describing it right now. And that will also absolutely work. But again, like I said before, it's about that feeling of how, how it feels under my fingers, how it feels on the instrument and how it um, allows me to explore and, and, and kind of just feeds my curiosity. Keep, keep track of the music and, and make sure the music is first before the pedals. Then you're going to come up with all these great musical combinations that work fantastic for what you're doing. All right, next is distortion, fuzz, overdrive. All of the dirt style pedals are going to be in here. Now, typically when I think about the order of dirt pedals, which is where a lot of us kind of get into conversations about order, I really like to put the highest gain stuff closer to the instrument as possible and the lower gain stuff closer to the amplifier. And the reason why I say this is if you already have a gained up pedal that's already kind of at the limits of what it can do, and then you're putting another overdrive going into it before it, there's not really much more room for it to go and it kind of just sends it into kind of a, a displeasing kind of semi square wave and it doesn't necessarily add anything to what that pedal is already doing. It can sometimes just be a mess, just a blob of gain and not really that differentiated. But if you take a high gain pedal and then you boost after it, it's not only going to raise the output volume, but you're going to get more of the complementary EQ of that following pedal. It kind of helps fill it out a little bit better. Now, there's some exceptions to this in terms of where people might run things, but generally when I'm thinking about fuzzes, distortions, and overdrives, I would generally put the fuzzes presuming that they're not impedance sensitive with which they would go first in the chain before the buffer if that were the case. Then I would go into the distortion type effects, you know, that are kind of maybe more asymmetrical clipping, the higher gain stuff. And then I would go into the overdrive devices. So if I'm thinking about something, let's say like a rat, a big muff, maybe something like a sparkle drive, which has a clean blend. We should also mention that as earlier, we said that bass players love parallel controls. I find that the sparkle drive and a lot of bass players love overdrives that have parallel controls on them. It allows them to blend in the clean sound or the sound of the unaffected bass or whatever has come before that pedal in with the distortion sound so you can blend those two things together. A very excellent sleeper pedal, by the way, for all you bass players out there, Voodoo Lab Sparkle Drive, excellent, excellent pedal. And also the EBS Multi Drive. Now, if I had all these effects, the way that I would order them is I'd put the Big Muff first, that's kind of more of a fuzz, probably the highest gain. Then I would put the Rat. Then I would put probably the Sparkle Drive and then end with the EBS Multi Drive. And I would go in that sequence again, assuming that the bass was first, then Muff, then Rat, then Sparkle Drive then going to the EBS multi-drive because it gives me the most flexibility for stacking. Now, again, if you're not stacking or combining two different overdrives or distortions or fuzzes at once, then the order is not so critical here. But I wanna bring in Yannick to break this down a little bit further and kind of show us with different shades of gain and overdrive, maybe not these exact same pedals, but showing us how stacking higher and lower gain might be more complementary in certain sequences than others so you can really get a feel for what that sounds like. Okay, so when it comes to distortion and fuzz, first of all, I'm a big fan. I'm not your guy who's going out and playing like Metallica covers or trying to get that kind of genty sound, particularly in what I do for myself. Uh, but as a sideman, when I when I have to go to the studio and play on other people's records, that is absolutely something that's on my radar and combinations of these kind of pedals, high gain, low gain pedals. Um, 
I'm also super lucky over the years that I've collected a bunch of really nice pieces, things that I can genuinely say I have used many, many times and can recommend you try for kind of all budgets. I'm holding the Fazista and the Agro from Aguilar, super solid pedals. Um, you might want to check out a, a video I did for the Aguilar Artist Loft. More recently, I have a couple of super nice pedals from Jam Pedal, the Rattler and the Red Muck. Really, really powerful stuff. Um, a, a, lot of, a lot of these pedals, uh, kind of hark back to the original Big Muff, the Sovtech Big Muff by Electro Harmonics from back in the early 90s. I have a couple of these bad boys. Something that me and John Davis are super fans of is the Exotic Effects Bass BB preamp. Amazing pedal. If you set it the right way, this can be of such a great distortion pedal. Just smash the gain and then bring in the volume. And this sounds amazing in combination with kind of one of these style octave pedals, the OC2, Boss OC2 style octave pedals to make a synth bass sound. Another one that both John Davis and I are huge fans of is the Zvex Woolly Mammoth, the real, the real deal, not the Vexter, the actual real deal. Crazy high end in the budget department. It's very difficult to tame, actually. Um, and, you know, I've had varying degrees of success with it. But when I really want to go absolutely crazy, it's either the Woolly Mammoth or it's the Big Muff. And uh, yeah, a lot of fun in terms of fuzz. But as you can see in my uh, board, currently I don't have a specific fuzz or distortion pedal. More recently, I've kind of got into some more modern pedals like the Dark Glass, the Alpha Omega, and the Microtubes Ultra, like I'm holding here. Crazy powerful pedals, definitely more on the modern, genty sound. And I don't try and get too complicated with it either. It's I really want to run as clean a path as possible. Remember, Mason said that the signal chain doesn't really matter if you're not combining effects. Well, the less effects I combine, the more pure my signal can be. So that's kind of my concept when I'm going into these kind of distortions and fuzzes. If I'm, if I'm going for that sound, that that's what's happening. And when I just want that flavor, like you heard me push that distorted sound through some effects then the ionetha franta bit is fantastic as is the meris otto bit junior that has the sample rate reduction and the bit crushing those kind of have all of my all of my needs taken care of on this board next in the signal path is eq now i've got here the equalizer from our friends over at source audio and i just think this is great because it's a programmable eq gives you lots of different options on how to cut and adjust the different equalization of your bass rig. Now why I love this in this position is that it allows you to just mellow out or intensify anything that you want coming out of the gain stage of the pedal board. I think this is the most valuable place to put it that affects the things that you really need to have some control over, extra EQ control, and you can also almost use this as a second channel to any one of your distortion or overdrive pedals. In addition to using it as a boost, if you set all the EQs flat, and you jump up that level control, you can basically use this as just a clean boost that just increases the level of everything, just like if you had a boost channel on an amplifier, which is pretty cool. Now this position is somewhat uncontroversial. The only other place that I might see somebody use an EQ is up front if they kind of want to EQ their bass to sound a little bit different that affects everything that's coming after it. If maybe they want to kind of give a P bass more of a jazz bass feel by mellowing it out a little bit, or they want to try to give something maybe more of an aggressive sound that their bass doesn't produce on their own. That might be a case to use a little bit earlier, but generally this is where we see people use it. I don't think we need to have Yannick on this one. I think that for most bass players that I see, if they're using an EQ, this is generally where we see it used. Of course, you're always welcome to experiment and see where you might like it best. Next is definitely a place that has some amount of controversies, the volume pedal. Now, I got the Boss FV500L shown here because I'm presuming that you want the low impedance version if you've done the high quality buffering or you have an active bass like I've already recommended a little earlier in the signal chain. Now the volume pedal is something that can go in a few different places. Some people like those volume pedals right up front, but if you put a volume pedal up front, it's basically going to do the same as what your volume pot does on your bass itself. As you roll it down, it's going to clean up the signal path if you already have some distortion on, but it's also going to attenuate. I always recommend that you put the volume pedal after all the drive pedals. The main reason being is that you already got that control on the bass itself. You don't want to have that redundancy by putting it up front. Putting the volume pedal after all the distortion overdrive pedals gives you the most flexibility. You can clean it up on the bass with that volume control. 
and on the foot pedal volume control, you can attenuate just like a master volume. You could also use a volume pedal in your effects loop if you have an effects loop on your amplifier, and this will equally act as a master volume, but probably only necessary if you're generating a lot of distortion from the amplifier itself. If you're using pedals for the distortion and the amplifier is relatively clean, there's not gonna be a whole lot of value in using the effects loop. Next is modulation. Now this is another place where there is some variability. Some people like to have certain modulation pedals before distortion, other modulation pedals after distortion. But let's just kind of generally talk through some of the modulation pedals we might see on bass. I think phaser is definitely something that we would see. Flanger, also something that we would see, especially in the classical sense. Chorus, also a pedal that we would see quite a bit in classical bass rigs. Now, on a lot of the classical bass rigs, we typically see phaser and flanger earlier in the chain, before overdrive devices, and we'll typically see chorus a little bit closer to the amplifier. Now, in terms of the signal path, this can be mixed up quite a bit. Some people like some of them before, some of them like after. I've even seen a case where chorus comes before some of the distortion effects. But thinking about a lot of classical albums and ways that we've heard chorus, modulation, things like phaser and flanger used in a lot of historic albums. Usually we see them in terms of the flanger and phaser coming before the distortion if there is any sort of bass distortion pedals and then seeing the chorus a little bit closer to the amp. That's very similar also in a guitar type setup. But you might also see situations where these effects are used in a parallel mixer. Something like the Exotic X Blender was a really popular device that was coming out in the last 10 years or so that a lot of bass players utilized and would put effects like these in those parallel mixers so that they could blend them in with the distorted signal or with the clean bass signal and be able to mix those in parallel. And another place that we might see these used is in the effects loop. Some bass players have an amplifier that has an effects loop. They're running the amplifier with some amount of dirt or maybe even in some cases clean and they just want to isolate these from the preamp and have them in between the preamp and the power amp, which is what an effects loop basically is, is splitting off between the preamp and the power amp of your bass amp. And they're putting their modulation effects there, maybe in addition to their delay and reverb effects as well. But let's bring in Yannick to break this all down, talk to us about where he likes these effects and where we might see these and how these might sound in some different applications in different orders. So the modulation I have happening on this particular board really comes at the end. And actually the most aggressive modulation uh, effect I have on the board right now comes at literally at the very, very, very end. It's the, it's the dark uh, side of the dark world from Chase Bliss. And I love this. vibey and cinematic with that. So that's one of the reasons, it's actually not a bad example of why I like to have some modulation at the very end. I also have the Chase Bliss Mood. It's a little more of a complicated pedal, but that's definitely a bunch of modulation stuff as well. And it's basically a micro looper, which has a bunch of modulating uh, options with it. So I can create a loop like that. Just It also has its own reverb channel as well. So when I push that through its own reverb, you start to get these beautiful pads. And then of course, at the very, 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 very end of the signal chain is the, the looper. So I can capture what's going on there. That's the concept with having that modulation towards the end of the chain. I can grab everything that's before it, filter it, mess with it, modulate it, dump it into the looper create transitional things, then I'm, I'm really moving compositionally with my looping. Again, it's not very conventional as a bass player, um, but that is how I use modulation. And uh, it's no more or less valid than the way Mason explained how, how he suggests using modulation either. Next, let's go to time-based effects. And in terms of time-based effects, I'm meaning reverb and delay. Now, these are typically the last two things in the chain. And as you can see from our last video, I like inverting the order of the reverb and the delay. I like putting the reverb first and then into the delay because I like having the reverb on every delay trail. However, classically, most people are typically putting delay 
before reverb. Now I'd say in most cases these effects are usually the last in the chain, but there's also a case to be made to put these in the effects loop. As I had mentioned also with the modulation, some people like to put these effects after the preamp of their bass amplifier. They like to have these used and be completely isolated and separated from any sort of preamp distortion coming after them. So they put them in the effects loop so that it can avoid all that. Again, this is something you could experiment with if your amp has an effects loop. If it doesn't have an effects loop, then you don't even need to worry about that. I think pretty much you're going to have those two effects running last in the signal path. And I would experiment both ways. I'd see if you like it better with the reverb going into the delay like I do. So you get that reverb on every delay trail, or you can reverse it where you have the delay first and then the reverb, and the reverb is going to tail off with those trails before the delay trails off just because those delay times are typically much longer than a reverb. But let's see Yannick's take on these, how he feels like they interact, his preferred order. Let's go to him and see what he thinks. So with time-based effects, I think I've given you some pretty, uh, pretty good examples of how I'm using reverb, for instance. I have a delay, like a tape delay down here in the, in the, in the HX Stomp. And I actually have those set in parallel. So there's the big debate, you know, the, the recent video from Mason from the Rig Doctor about, hey, delay first or reverb first, what, what goes into what. I really like the concept. I like Mason's concept of being able to hear the reverb on each trail of the delay. That's a great use case for putting the reverb first. Now with the HX Stomp, I kind of have the option to move them back and forth um, or have them in parallel. But if you're using, you know, traditional stomp boxes like this, the, the, the Jam Delay Llama uh, Extreme, badass pedal by the way, unbelievably musical and has some pitch shifting in it as well. Highly recommend checking that out. If you're using regular pedals like this, Hall of Fame 2 by TC Electronic, great reverb. You know, no reason why you can't just switch them around and find out what works for you. One thing I used to use a bunch before I switched to, to just MIDI and, and, and not audio switching was the Boss ES5. Um, I know the I think the ES3 and the ES8 do the same thing where you can switch the order of the pedals. Not only am I a fan of both ways of doing it, but my stuff kind of generally comes towards the end of the signal chain. My reverb is the last thing in the signal chain. Now my, my standalone reverb pedal, um, there, like I said, there's, there's some delay in the Chase Bliss mood. So I have some delay in a stomp box as well as what I have programmed in the HX stomp. I'm also a big fan of putting a delay pedal into a fuzz and, and you know, messing with how that, uh, how the fuzz reacts to those delays and those, you know, less attacking trails coming into it. I would highly recommend trying fuzz, delay, reverb as one combination and then fuzz, reverb, delay. So much you can do with that. You'd be super, super creative. So last in the chain, we have our buffers again. Now, we talked about buffers on the input, having that nice input impedance that matches our bass amp, but on the output, we actually don't need to be so concerned about the input impedance anymore. We really need to be concerned about the output impedance and making sure it's as low as possible. Now, if you have a high quality buffer that you already used on the input that matches your amp and has that low output impedance, you could use that again on the output buffer. And a lot of pedals today actually meet, again, that standard that I've already spoke about, the kind of matching that input impedance with your amp, you know, anywhere between 500K and about, you know, five to 10 megs, depending on the amp. Again, they're all over the place for bass, and then getting as close to zero on the output impedance as possible. Now, I've listed a bunch of pedals in this video that you see linked above, and again, in the description below about pedals that have great built-in buffers. Your delay or reverb pedal, depending on which one is last, may already meet this specification, might have a 100 ohm output impedance or lower. And if it does, then you may not have a need for an additional output buffer to drive back to the amplifier. Just wanted to put that in there, just in case you might have something that already meets that criteria. But if it doesn't, you can choose from any of the pedals that we've listed in our recommended buffers in the links. Also, you could look at something like the Sunday Driver, which we recommend as the input buffer, which is a great buffer that has a variable input and output impedance. And it also has a DI out option, which is really, really handy as an output buffer. If you want to use this go DI into the actual mixer and you don't want to go into an amplifier, it can be a great alternative pedal to use in this particular application. Now in a stereo system, if you want to stereo out, you need to make sure that you actually have a buffer for each side, the left side and the right side. So in that case, you would need two output buffers to condition both sides of the line. Now also with the stereo system, you may even need to use an isolation transformer on one side. If you're running to multiple amps, sometimes there can be an issue with the ground loop, 
This is gonna help eliminate that. It's also gonna match the polarity or the phase of the two amplifiers as they're not always gonna be the same, especially if they're two different makes or models of amplifier that may be dissimilar from each other. Also, if you're going for a cable method using an effects loop, you may also wanna put a buffer on the return. There is no standard for buffers inside of effects loops on amplifiers, so some amps may have a great great quality buffered effects loop and others may not have a high quality buffered effects loop. In that case, you could always get something that would turn a passive loop into an active loop. One that I've always recommended is the Kleinulator. I will link that in the description below if you're interested. That basically is gonna take your passive loop, is gonna give you active controls of it, and it's gonna allow you to be able to control the send and return level so that you can attenuate down to instrument level going into some of your effects and then bring that back to line level on the output with a return volume. This is designed to live right behind your amplifier, not on the pedal board, and is basically sort of replacing the existing effects loop. But even if you have a high quality loop, you may still have a need for an output buffer coming back to it. Again, you should check the specs of your pedals in the effects loop to make sure that the last pedal that's on or buffered has a high quality, low output impedance, right around 100 ohms is ideal. In conditions where you wouldn't need an output buffer, if you have something, let's say like a Nobles preamp that has an XLR out, that's already balanced, that's already low output impedance, so you don't need to worry about putting a buffer with something like that if you already have something that's converting to some sort of DI or XLR on the output of the system and is being used as some sort of preamp those will not require an additional output buffer after them in order to make it back to your mixing board or whatever it is that you're connecting to, whether it's your interface or your DAW. So let's do one last big recap of my recommended signal path, and I'm gonna put Yonex recommended signal path next to mine so you can kind of see how our two compared, and you can choose which one might be right for you. You can experiment with them both, or even try something that's not listed here. Again, the rules with signal path is that there are no rules. The things that you like best are what you like best, and nobody's gonna police that. These are just kind of overarching recommendations of where you might wanna put things. So let's start back at the beginning. You come into the system, you could hit a DI if you want, if you wanted to have that just stock bass sound going to the mixing board, and then have another side that was going to the pedal board. Optional thing, not a requisite thing. Then you're gonna go into your input buffer. Again, you don't need the input buffer if you got a wireless, or if you have any sort of active bass, those aren't gonna be needed. Then from the buffer, you're gonna go into your tuner. Now we mentioned that some tuners already have high quality input and output buffers. Peterson's a good example of one that has, that has a good input buffer already. Low output impedance, if you already had that, that would negate the need for the input buffer before it. After that, then I recommend going into the filter effects. These would be things like envelope filters and bass waz. Those would be going there. Then from there, I like going into the dynamic pedals, compressors, this is a good place to put those. From there, I then like going into the pitch pedals, like the Octave, the OC2 from Boss is a great one. I like keeping it there, keeping it closer to the bass, so that's very reactive. From there, I like going into the fuzz, distortion, and overdrive pedals. I like putting the highest gain stuff closer to the bass, the lower gain stuff closer to the amp. So it's going in a cascading type of sequence from highest gain to middle gain to lowest gain in terms of the sequence. This is also a place where you could put effects that have parallel controls like the sparkle drive, or you could even use something like a parallel mixer like the Exotic X Blender if you wanted to blend your distortion pedals in parallel with the clean signal, a very cool feature to use, especially for bass players. After that, I go into the equalization. This is gonna kind of be almost like a mastering effect or kind of a finishing effect for any of our overdrive or distortion devices. You could also use this earlier in the chain if you wanted to have more effect over the actual bass signal that was hitting all the other effects. From there, I then go into a volume pedal, the Boss FE500L. If you've got those high quality buffers, you definitely wanna get the L version, it stands for low impedance. Almost every single volume pedal company makes a low impedance version in the event that you're using it in a scenario where it's buffered or receiving active pickups. From there, we're gonna go into modulation. Now I'm gonna move some modulation stuff to actually be before the overdrives. I'm gonna put the phaser and flanger before the overdrives and I'm gonna keep the chorus after the overdrives. That's how I hear it in my head and how I think of a lot of the classical albums that people have put out over time where you really hear those effects exemplified. From there, I'm then gonna go into the time-based effects, and I like going delay after reverb, but you could do this in either way and still have plenty of merit in either, in either of the situations. I really just like this particular order where I get those reverbs on every single delay trail. Really sounds best to me. I really like that type of effect and how that's run. 
Now again, overarching parallel mixers like the Exotic X Blender could really be put around any of these type of effects if you wanted to be able to have parallel control. It's a very cool device for bass players, so definitely check out the X Blender if you haven't. There's a couple other parallel mixers that are out there that are also very cool. Old Blood Noise Endeavors makes a really cool one, and Exotic also makes a stereo version. If you have a stereo pedal that you want to kind of have the X Blender effect working with, that's very cool. Also, the Gig Rig makes the Wetter Box, which is also a similar type parallel mixer that allow you to do similar things to what we talked about here. At the end of the signal path, you're going to then go into your output buffers, one output buffer for mono, two output buffers for stereo, and if you got it a four cable method, you're going with an amplifier that has an effects loop, you may even want a buffer on the return. Again, check the specs of your pedals to see if they maybe already meet that requirement for a high quality, low impedance buffered output. You may have some devices that already meet that criteria. Pretty much everything from Strymon falls into that category if you're using Strymon effects last in the chain. And remember, if you have something that already converts to a DI output, something like a Nobles preamp or some of the stuff made by Sansamp, these things already convert to low impedance. They have an XLR output. You don't have another need for a buffer to go after that. However, if you're going unbalanced, whether that's back to your amplifiers, whether that's back to a mixing board, you're definitely going to want those output buffers to make sure that you drive the line going all the way back to your DAW, to your mixing board, whatever it is, if the cables are again remaining unbalanced and they're not converted to a balanced or XLR output. So that was our signal path, our bass rundown. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, this is a just a generalized overview. This isn't the truth. This isn't the absolute best way to do it. The best way to do it is really the way that you enjoy the sound that you like. And so I welcome you to experiment with this. And if you have any feedback of other alternative ways that you might want to run pedals or recommendations that you think that we should consider or maybe use on a future video, please do put that in the comments. We would love to hear from you. Big thank you to Yannick for helping us out. Do check out his channel. If you're a bass player, it is absolute gold, the content and the quality of stuff that he's putting out. So do check him out. I'll also link his channel in the description. And if you want to support further what we're doing, we have a lot of different ways to do that. You can go check us out over on Patreon, where we have several different options of different levels of membership, including one that I couldn't make totally free because Patreon won't allow a free account, but it's $1, $12 a year for the account. Great way to stay in touch with us, be a part of the conversation. We do weekly live streams that are private for our supporting members, as well as public live streams every week that you don't have to pay for, so you have options to do either way. We also have private tone consulting over on the rigdr.com, as well as all of the materials that we use for all our pedal boards, including the pedal board surfaces themselves, tie down mounts, zip ties, all the Velcro that we use, all the accessories that are used to build our rigs. In addition, check out vertexeffects.com where we sell all the pedals that we manufacture. So if you're interested in supporting us, you can always buy one of our pedals from us or from one of our authorized dealers. And you can see our dealer list again on the website. And another free way to help support what we're doing is check out our podcast, The Rig Doctor Podcast. It's on Apple, Spotify, all the common podcatchers. So please do check that out. It's a great way to support us, listen to us on your way to work or on your commute. Helps out the channel, gives you another way to interact and maybe take some of these conversations into a more long form option. So please do check that out if you haven't already. Again, I'm Mason Marangella from Vertex Effects, AKA The Rig Doctor. Thank you for exploring Bass Signal Path with us today. See you later.